Anyway, Albrecht was a uh, uh, more of a physiologist, and it was it kind of brings me into you know what what I'm talking about is uh, his big thing was about soil health, healthy soils, healthy people, healthy animals, yep. and we haven't quite gone there yet. We're talking about healthy soils as as some sort of goal, and what that means, you know, that's that's been discussed earlier by some good points. And when we get to that point of saying a healthy soil produces a crop that produces healthy people, then we've really made progress. We've made so much progress. We're all 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 the way back to 1940 when Albrecht was going through these things uh, uh, like a prophet. So. That's that's interesting. I'll I'll go ahead and, and talk a little bit about uh, this, okay. where I started with Albrecht, if you like. And let me see if I can if I have control of the uh, slides. I'm not sure how to do that. Okay, down here. Maybe. Yeah. There yeah. we go. All right. You're on yeah. it, Bob. This is the state of Missouri, and uh, I don't know uh, about. Jim's planning here to have three Bobs in a row talk. That's got to be very confusing. And uh, for, for four hours when he said, hey, Bob, what, what's going on? I, I, I keep looking. But uh, um, anyway, this is the state of Missouri. And that, that beige color there in the central southern part, that's called the Ozarks. And uh, Albrecht's career began in the early 1900s at the University of Missouri when he was tasked with the assignment of providing microbial inoculants for legumes. And you got to keep in mind that uh, that at that time, everybody was an organic farmer. There were no synthetic fertilizers. And so uh, they needed inoculants for their legumes to have a rotation that would work. Well, what happened in that Ozark area was that the uh, the inoculants didn't work, and he he talks about how uh, go back to that. He talks about how in that Ozark area he had to be rather hard shouldered, he called it, and and tell the farmers there was nothing wrong with his inoculants. Their problem was their soil lacked the fertility to even feed his bugs. And that, that the main culprit was a lack of calcium. And so he did a number of experiments and uh, uh, to show the calcium, how essential it was and for soil biology, for everything. And he went on from that even and, and did a lot of work showing that uh, soil fertility is very much related to animal health and to human health. And, uh, uh, he's noted for saying food is fabricated soil fertility. There was a lot of people at that time, and this is again uh, 1916, 1820s, uh, looking at the soil. And it's rather incredible, even back in those early days, they were plating and, and trying to, to test for and analyze the, the biology in the soil. And, uh, uh, they realized back in this, the 20s even that uh, the biology and the chemistry and the physics uh, were all interrelated. And so whatever you do, uh, you know, you have to realize the soil is a living system. And if you were to be thoughtful about your soils, you got to consider the impact of everything you or Mother Nature does to the soil. Whatever it is, you have to think, how does it affect the chemistry, the biology, or the physics? What's the impact of you not doing something even? So as an example, if we think about uh, uh, if we increase uh, airspace, we have more air in the soil, we're going to increase uh, the chemical balance. That's going to increase the microbial activity. You're going to improve the soil structure as a result of that. You're going to have more nitrogen and more phosphorus available. All these things are interrelated. The, oops, yeah. <clears throat> the 
Uh, what happened in the uh, later on those, you know, this this ideal of the this the biology, the chemistry, and the physics being interrelated, that's in everybody's elementary soils book. Yet they tend to go on and then just say, but the thing is, it's all about pH and making these minerals available. And I call that the solution chemistry approach to looking at soils. And you know, I'm just here to remind you that the soil is more like a lumen than a sandbox. And I'm being conservative here, but an acre has at least over three and a half tons of organisms that, and that's equivalent to five cows per acre that we've got to take care of. If you think about the soil as a sandbox, you expect that it's important to have nutrients soluble so plants can just suck them up. Well, these, these cows, uh, that's a lot different, isn't it? The soil is a lot more like a rumen. As a matter of fact, when you have uh, these five cows, you've got to nourish them. You've got to provide uh, uh, you know, all their minerals, micronutrients, and uh, you know it's not just a sandbox. If you think that soil is a sandbox, you think that when you apply in, it, it goes right into the plant. But the reality is much different when uh, when scientists uh, the next slide. when scientists look at uh, how nitrogen is used in the soil, they can use an isotope N15 to follow the path of that plant uptake. And the nitrogen uptake rarely exceeds 40 percent. So the, you know, the question is, well, gee, are we just wasting that, that, that synthetic nitrogen we're putting on? And, and I say, no, hold on. We also know that when we apply 150 pounds of N, that uh, oftentimes will grow 150 to 200 bushel corn, sometimes better. And that 150 bushel corn takes up over 210 pounds of N. Right, you following me? So we put on 150 pounds of N, but only 40% of that is taken up by the plant. That's only 60 pounds. Yet the plant takes up 210 pounds of N total. This means 90 pounds came from the organic matter, soybean residue, the biology in the soil. And so biology is important. Now, in our last talk, we, we, we heard how typically universities consider, well, you get 20 pounds of, of, of N per 1% of organic matter. But uh, I think almost everybody's experience can really do much better than that if we got a good balanced soil, at least. So the question is, what do we have to do to keep those cows happy inside that, that soil? We have to feed them. We have to have the carbon, the carbon and the nitrogen and all the mineral needs. And yes, the micro even need micronutrients. Albrecht and many others in, in the last, last part of the century, of the early last century, did so much to educate farmers on the importance of feeding the soil. But when the 50s came around and we had these synthetic fertilizers, we, came, uh, we started to think about fertilizer as plant food instead of soil food. And this leads us to think of the nutrients in the soil as a pool for the plants, just to suck up rather than nutrition for the whole soil complex. And then that leads us to thinking the fix for waterlogged soils is more in or slow release in. And the solution should be to fix the problem that is impairing the drainage. Now, I'm not against synthetic fertilizers. Neither was Albrecht, by the way. Uh, I can see how they fit into the picture very nicely. And let's go back to that 150 bushel corn thinking about that. Where did the other 90 pounds in go that didn't go into the corn? And that was used by the microbes to digest crude organic matter and make humus that will cycle and feed future crops. So it wasn't that we wasted in 
because it didn't go directly into the, the crop. It's that it was used to feed microbes. And Albrecht used to say, the microbes eat at the first table. So we have to take care of them. Now, what do we consider a healthy soil? Here's a picture of a soil with a lot of roots and aggregation. Uh, you've got some mycorrhizae almost you can see there, some fungi growing. You know, and some people might say, wow, that, that's got porosity, it's got some wormholes in it, that's great. But the truth is, that soil had a, available phosphorus from the P1 test of just five parts per million. So it's not going to be quote, a healthy soil. It's not going to nourish a plant. It's not going to uh, produce a crop. So, so often on this conversation about healthy soils, uh, are we just concerned about how much carbon we can fix? Are we more interested in producing as much high quality food as possible in an environmentally and economically acceptable way? And so I keep that in mind when, when I'm uh, talking about soil health. Sometimes I think farmers forget to defend themselves, if you will, as they grow food. And I've actually had people say, well, farmers don't grow food. They, they grow crops for feed to animals, et cetera. Well, that's, that becomes food, too. But if we think about a cornfield, uh, corn bean rotation. I did some calculations a number of years ago, and it comes out that 100,000 acres in a corn bean rotation, with producing corn at 150 bushel and beans at 45, not a dramatically high yield, that produces enough kilocalories to feed 1 million people for one year. And so when you, you hear about a loss of farm ground, uh, you hear about taking farm ground out of production to put into uh, other uses, wildlife or shopping centers. Somebody's got to go without food almost to make that work out. This is Dave Hula, this year's winner of the, uh, of the corn yield contest. The record yield this year on no-till ground was over 530 bushel. It was done in Virginia. The 2014 yield was also over 500 bushel, and that was done in Georgia. Those are not states with naturally high organic matter and deep, rich soils, yet they were able to manage their soils to reach phenomenal yields. It also shows that corn genetics we have right now have great potential. Some ask, how are we going to feed the future world? Well, if the genetics are already here for the high yield, then we must consider that the answer is how we manage our soils. One of the tools uh, to understanding what we have in our soils is, uh, is soil testing. And, uh, I want to do a little explanation and give you some insight on, uh, on at least one of these tests is an example of, uh, of trying to understand what soil tests are really about. As I mentioned before, uh, people go into the pH and pK mode and often forget about the, the, these, these effects. But um, with the phosphorus, I'm going to go through these tests and, uh, and talk a little bit about what they mean. On, uh, we have at the top, these are all the same, whoops, there we go. Uh, these are all, uh, I guess, five different soils. Uh, I'll, whoops, my, uh, <laughs> my computer apparently is getting a mind of its own or somebody else's got <laughs> control of the slides. But anyway, um, with these tests, we've got the Bray P1, underneath that's the Olson. Uh, these are all the same soil tested different ways. Under that's the Morgan. Uh, down at the bottom is the water-soluble phosphorus test. Uh, just five different soils uh, tested six different ways. 
And um, just to give you some idea, what soil testing is trying to do, it's not trying to tell us what is plant available. A lot of people ask me, well, Rob, uh, you know, I want a water test because I think that's going to show me what is plant available. Or the Morgan or the Olson or the or the grapey one, you know, what is plant available? My point is, uh, we'll take, um, we can take the grapey one, fairly strong extract, and let's say if we, uh, if we're happy, and, and typically we think that we should have a sufficient amount of phosphorus to grow a crop if we've got 20 parts per million uh, phosphorus from the P1 extract. And we grow uh, a crop of uh, corn and soybeans. We're going to remove probably 100 pounds of phosphate uh, in a two-year rotation, as P205 at least. And if that happens, and we retest it after two years after that corn and bean rotation, what would we expect that gray P1 to drop to? And if you, most people are, are familiar with soil testing, nobody would think that just because we took off uh, 44 pounds, uh, excuse me, yeah, 44 pounds as P, in other words, we took off 100 pounds of P205 and converting that over to actual elemental P would be 44 pounds. We wouldn't expect that P1 to drop from 20 to zero. You'd say maybe it's going to go down to you know, drop five or six, perhaps, uh, but not the full 20. So my point is almost all these tests extract uh, a lot less than what the plants do. And at least that's the plants and their symbiotic partners. And that's OK. The point of soil tests is that if you're working with somebody that's familiar with the test, familiar with the field applications of it, they can tell you that at 20, uh, we need to be applying some maintenance fertilizer. We'd like to keep it that. At uh, maybe uh, 45 parts per million P, we're going to cut back and not need to apply any phosphorus on a gray P1. Phosphorus is as P1. Um, you know, they're going to be able to tell you what to go with. Uh, over on that. If you are a little bit familiar with these uh, these tests, they all point to the same thing. In other words, that first column is a really high testing uh, uh, P soil. With, on the Bray P1, it's running 82 parts per million. Uh, the Olson is 49. The Morgan was 68. Uh, the soluble water soluble was was 11. And you go over in the last column, and, and the desired points for these would be around 20 for the P1. The Morgan, uh, you'd want to be up around 4, you'd be content. The Olson at 12. And so these are all telling you that about the same thing, that those middle uh, soils are, need some maintenance, and that they're not in too bad a shape. And that soil way over to the right is low, no matter which uh, test we use, and it's it's just a really deficit soil. So there's lots of different soil tests out there. If you're working with people that are used to them, and work with their with how what desired levels you want, you're going to get the same kind of message. Uh, every test has its strengths, and every test has its weaknesses, and that's where it's important that you. Uh, Work with somebody that knows what they're doing that way. Um, one of the things uh, Jim brought up to me before was how it's important to be sure to use uh, the opportunity to use tests to tell you different things. And if you're no-till, we're going to have some segregation. And you better take a look at that along with a deeper sample. So I recommend going 0 to 4 inches on at least some of your samples in the same area going 0 to 6. But you'll see something like this sometimes. If you're going to have good humus, uh, 
up at the surface, then it's going to be not so much if you look at the whole depth. Uh, the calcium may be down, depending on what you've done, on the surface. It might look fine if you look at the whole depth. Uh, phosphorus might be segregated, and so might be the potassium. And yet, uh, so you need to take a look uh, on no-till especially to see some of these different depths. Another tool we could even use would be looking at the different levels and, and doing the sand, silt, and clay on uh, different segments going down through the profile. I think where I was ending was um, talking about, I think if you, if you have a soil test like we're doing, we learn a lot of these things about what what's going to be the holding capacity of our soil, uh, what are going to be the downfalls with the likelihood of uh, issues with with uh, poor drainage. You know, if we get magnesium over 900 pounds uh, per acre or magnesium over 450 parts per million, we're going to have some issues we've got to treat physically. And... Um, uh, that might mean cover crops, it might mean tillage, uh, you know, a whole array of things are open. I think where, and I'm not sure where the mic cut out before, uh, but I was saying that if you looked at those Virginia and Georgia soils, which did a phenomenal job of, of growing high-yield crops, uh, things must have been working there very well. And yet if you use the uh, very... We don't know this, but I think the likelihood that they would have tested high on the Cornell scale for uh, active or uh, organic matter and that their water holding capacity was as high as you find in upstate New York, uh, you know, I, I don't think they would they would fit in that category. Uh, over the years, people have asked me, well, you know, what's the ideal exchange capacity to be growing a crop in? On one hand, I think, well, there's not going to change yours as much. So it has to do more with how you manage what you have. And in that regard, we've got high yields from heavy soils. We've got high yields from light soils. So that's where uh, being cognizant of what we have and then how to manage it is the critical part. Uh, I think I'll leave it there and, and go ahead to go some questions. Um, Are you, can you hear me, Jim? Or yes, lost you on my computer. Okay. Yes, I hear you loud and clear, Bob. Okay. We had a question concerning the calcium and magnesium. Um, I presume it's based on the relationships of the two minerals on the colloid. And I I waded out into the swamp there a little while, and just about the time you were coming back on, and. Um, You've discussed it. I'm intrigued, Bob, that you used um, parts per million and pounds per acre in describing magnesium levels that could be problematic versus using uh, base saturation percentages. The reasoning? Well, yeah. Uh, and the reasoning is so many people are, are not cognizant of, of base saturation ratios and their importance, but um, it's certainly what we've based all our work on. Uh, but to translate and make it simple for folks that just have somebody else's soil test. Uh, I got you. It helps help them kind of realize it that way. But you know, if, if I say 25% uh, you know, base saturation magnesium, uh, some folks working with a, with a different extract may have no idea what's going on. Well, now we've lost the uh, lost my video. I don't know about you. Can you still hear me? Uh, I'm on the phone. So I can hear you. We can hear you just fine, Bob. Voice is doing fine. And we have our back here. Okay. We have the visual here too. Yeah. Um, in fact, the next visual uh, yeah. is kind of uh, interesting. And I don't. I didn't really want to go into unless you. Uh, People want me to go through about how silly it is just to look at the the pH of systems. Uh, I, I can do that with the, uh, you know, I've got some slides on that, but um, I'm just not sure what my 
my time frame was or where I am on it anyway. Um, but the, you know, it's, they say in Missouri, we're the show me state. And an awful lot of what I see with uh, some of these academic approaches to trying to define soil health is um, just pure academics. The idea that a soil is now healthy and is going to stay healthy is is ironic, right? Uh, we can have uh, one soil that the climate is perfect and so that the even though it's rather impaired with drainage, everything works well that year and we have you know, an exceptional crop, healthy crop, um, good things happening, and then things change. Uh, the next year we have a different rainfall pattern and, and we're not producing what we want. So um, there's, you know, in my book that we're just looking at things as a kind of a, a one, one moment in time when we say it's a healthy soil. On these committees that they put together nationally, they they packed it mostly with uh, academics and not too many people of uh, from the field experience. I'm I'm curious of these of the people on the conference if any of them have been invited to uh, you know to sit on those boards and and discuss their views of, of soil health. Uh, and that's you know that's another issue. Hmm. Um, so. And we talk about uh, so often methods are discarded because it might take a little extra time or uh, be a little bit more expensive. And uh, to me, that shouldn't be the issue. Uh, Looking at mineralization in the soil uh, can be a real eye-opener for some farmers. Uh, uh, There's just so much more of that occurring than we typically give credit for. There's so much more uh, nitrogen residue left in a field after we grow 70 or 80 bushel beans than people give credit for. So those mm-hmm. sorts of things are going on. Folks ought to be out there uh, looking at their residue, doing some, some tests on it, uh, post-mortem, uh, you know, just uh, measuring a square foot three times in the field, collecting that material, uh, Getting a dry weight on it and doing the analysis on it, you'd be surprised about what's what's in that residue. Uh, these are things that, oh yeah, they might cost you thirty or forty bucks, but you know, the value of what you're seeing there and the motivation that would give you to preserve it uh, has to be high on the chart. Bob, speaking of sending spending money. Um, are you seeing uh, any more requests for the micro minerals like cobalt and molybdenum and silica? Are you seeing much interest in those and the requests for tests? Yeah, the, we you know we do a lot of international work, and uh, with our work in the UK and, and Australia and New Zealand, they have been much more focused on that uh, for animal health reasons than uh, yeah. you know, the American growers. I would say no. Uh, most of our grain crop growers have, have not looked at that. And and on the flip side of that, when we look at it, we're not often sure where we should be. So that's mm-hmm. uh, some of these things. You know, we have to we have to get that information and, and do some comparisons of uh, uh, mm-hmm. this is working here, this is good, this is a good level. When we look at tissues the last few years, I've, uh, I've noted the same thing that... Uh, Bob from Iowa noted um, we have a hard time having as much sulfur and magnesium and manganese in those plants as uh, as we would like. It, it just seems like it, it's gone. Uh, you know, I work with a lot of different farmers, good farmers, but uh, it's really hard, even on a magnesium, magnesium deficient soil, to get them to at least try a non-GMO crop just to see if that uh, mm-hmm. helps them out at all. It uh, boggles my mind. Are you and the other thing, and I, I didn't get a chance to ask Don Huber, but um, if we're chelating manganese, there's lots of soils. We actually end up with finding as much manganese as we do magnesium. I mean, the magnesium is uh, below 100 parts per million a lot of the times. And so in that case, I think uh, the glyphosate might, might be an issue there. I just don't know uh, if that's part of the story or not. I see. 
How about, uh, do you run aluminum um, on tissue tests routinely or not? Not routinely. Um, again, that's something we've been, uh, you know, looking at uh, in the last couple of years. And uh, when we find aluminum, it's typically because people don't have their calcium up where it should be, uh, yeah. don't have boron where it should be. If you look at the periodic chart, and some of these elements uh, interact, and that boron is uh, right next to uh, that aluminum. And it's, it's, if we can keep the boron up and available, uh, again, we don't seem to have as much trouble with aluminum, the you know, mm -hmm. combination of things. Mm -hmm. Do you see very many people submitting those shallow cores that you suggested, that zero to four or zero to three? Are you seeing any more of that over the years, no-till? It goes in spurts. You know, somebody will get excited about it and take a look at it, and uh, uh, you know, then it's there. And that's that's probably good enough in a lot of ways. You know, just to make people aware of uh, if they really want to monitor how they're changing the humus and the soil. And I I have to go and, and, and brag a little bit on our, our organic matter test. I uh, it's a Walkley Black. It's been abandoned mostly because it's expensive. It's expensive to get rid of the stuff after you use it, not so much to, you know, so it's got a, uh, a chromium compound, which is a hazardous waste, and it's expensive to get rid of. So people have really uh, gone away from that, gone towards uh, loss of ignition, which is just going to show us the total crude organic matter. They're yep. trying to use the potassium permanganate and calling that the active carbon. Uh, yeah. I think that's going to be slowly adopted because it's um, it's it's so unstable. In other words, you have to read it right at 10 minutes, and and it depends on how long you shook it, all these different things. And, and yes, they're going to have to publish uh, protocols, but you know we've looked at it, and no matter what you do, that protocol is is really shaky. It gets to be a very um, um, judgmental, you know, thing. Is did I wait long enough? Is this different than that? Um, it's very hard to get down to quantitative chemistry that we like to use in the lab. So, yeah, uh, probably say that temperature and time are both involved with the potassium permanganate. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 But you can imagine kind of just, just the idea that huh? you're doing the test in in um, New York or in Georgia is going to be different, even on the same soils, because the temperature in the lab very likely is going to vary by five degrees. Things like that. It's this. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. A steamy day in Georgia is definitely going to give you a different rate of reaction than a cold day in Missouri, <laughs> unless yeah. you got that. Unless you got that temperature, Jack, just right. We got a question here from John Mark in uh, Ontario, Canada. He says, "How do we keep boron levels up?" Keep applying boron. Uh, you know, it, and I know in some, you know, that's a, a simple answer, but, uh, you know, that's a little bit ignorant. I'm not aware. Of, I know that some parts of Ontario, Canada are just a real sand based soil. And so yeah. that may require a real spoon feeding. I don't know, uh, you know, the particulars and exchange capacity he's talking about. But uh, on the one hand, that really is the answer. You've got to. Um, you know, either spoon feed something, or, or if if we can, you know, get there by making a, a, a two pound application of boron, that's that's great. Yeah, well, John, all the elements. John Mark is actually on. Um, he's probably got some clay loam soils, but for sure he's got silt loam soils, and I would guess that the clay content is borderline turning it into a clay loam. So they are fairly heavy. Um, Internal drainage is fair, but there's plenty of room for tile in his neighborhood, too. Um, Bob, is there any, you know, it, it, you look, I've been looking at your tests for 30 years, and or, I guess, or more, more. Oh, yeah, more now. 40. But, it, <laughs> but um, it, it seems to me now, it seems to me like, and I've got some people on here today that have been looking at your tests, and they're, very fastidious, like the Dave chances about their micro mineral levels and 
what it takes to keep them and get them and all that sort of stuff. It just seems like if we get to a one five or so or a two o, that they just kind of stabilize and stay there. Is there any real? Is that a figment of our imagination? Or is there some real explanation for why that could be happening? That's interesting. Um, I don't think it's a figment of your imagination. From the lab's point of view, we think, well, <laughs> these guys just got it up there and they're keeping it there. Um, no, because we keep so we putting don't it know. on, right? <laughs> we don't know what's going on at the other end so often. You know, many times I've been very fortunate that you guys are good about sharing the, uh, your observations with me, and, and that's made us a, a better lab of, uh, of adjusting things and, and, of course, mm. trying very hard to make it very, very repeatable. And that's, that's our, I think, our real claim to fame is that, yes, we're, we're using the Albrecht Protocol, and, and we are very serious about trying to have it very, very repeatable. So whatever you see in the field really is happening, and mm -hmm. it's not a figment of your imagination. So, um, no, I've, I've got a lot more people complaining that uh, where the hell did that boron go that I put on? But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd be interested, uh, I, Dave, you've looked at his tests now for a couple, three years. Do you see this tendency? Get us a comment down here or unmute yourself and comment. Um, anybody else who's got observations like that? The other thing, the other subject that's always been a preoccupation of mine, and I don't often get guys to invest in it. It's not a lot of money, but you and I started doing this a long time ago where I saw some really strange things happening uh, when we changed tillage and we started really handling air and water efficiently back in the 80s and through the 90s is I've done a lot of cation exchange. Uh, that is total cations. The, what is it? The 0.4 molar hydrochloric acid extraction where you really wash a lot of stuff off that colloid for me. Um, yeah. That has, yeah. It's it's been a nitrous really, digest, actually. Yeah. What is it? It's actually a nitric acid digest, and, and now we oh. do it with a microwave. But yeah, we're we're looking at uh, everything there, and uh -huh. as you as you've seen that it gets wild between different soils. In some cases, uh, the calcium that you see on the you know, all regular test is almost 100 percent of what's there. In other cases, it might be a, a third. Uh, magnesium oftentimes is uh, we might have a high mag on the exchangeable um, base saturation, and it's even a heck of a lot higher when we do a total digest, that it'll be higher than the total calcium in the soil. Mm -hmm. so in that case, we know, hey, we're not going to be washing that magnesium out. That's uh, We've yeah. got to adjust things physically that uh, we're not going to be able to just change that soil base saturation of magnesium to. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, I remember some of the early experiences. We had a farm with terribly low potashes and calciums were sky high. Mags are in the cellar and the young man didn't have money to do high mag lime. He didn't have money for potash. He just bought the farm, put in a milking parlor, put up a slurry store. You know, I mean, every excuse in the world for not to do anything. And I pulled the cations total with you and... This guy wound up with 44,000 pounds of potash per acre. Huh. And his calcium was in the trench. And yet his base saturation on exchangeable tests with you was uh, close to 85%. And his mag on the soil test was less than five. When the test came back, he was loaded with potash and magnesium. And his calcium was incredibly low in this parent material. And over time, that all began to manifest and his calcium levels dropped precipitously, his mag levels recovered and he never re never spread a single pound of magnesium material, stopped applying potash and in five years, he, he said to me over the kitchen table one morning, you know, if this potash keeps going up like this, we'll just sell this as a mine. <laughs> he had gone from less than one and a half percent base saturation to over 9%. And we didn't do anything except harvest alfalfa four to five times a year. And we couldn't drop the level of potash. Never put on any. It was ridiculous. And it was that parent material 
total cations test that really tipped us off that this is what we could expect to see happen as right. as we watched it happen. Do you see? Do That's you run a much rare of situation? <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, you know, uh, that brings up a, a, a thought that, you know, we uh, do a lot of pasture grass in, in Missouri and, and intensive uh -huh. grazing is uh, 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 very important. And some of the people teaching in, in uh, intensive grazing are showing that uh, we, just by having the grass growing and the, the cattle grazing, we, we build our potassium levels. But that work was done on soils that have uh, deep soils that are high in magnesium, and you can go a few counties over, uh, and we have a tenth of the magnesium in, the, in our subsoils that those guys do. And so um, that same observation is not going to uh, apply for the guy two counties over, but uh, he's going to be sorely disappointed when he doesn't have uh, the results that you know the guy in Linus did. So uh, it, it goes both ways, you know. Dave Chance, you're unmuted. What do you have to say? Um, I just wanted to, I guess, make a comment that um, I do appreciate uh, uh, the results I do get back from, from Bob's lab. Um, I find them very consistent, and um, I'm able to lay out pages from, you know, multiple years and, and, and see progress in areas uh, that we've worked on. And... Um, and that's that's really good. That that consistency of results is something that uh, that I like to like to measure. And, and uh, so I just appreciate the the, the testing procedure to use and and uh, and that type of thing. You had made a comment about boron. You know, am I seeing boron kind of level off? And um, I, I'm really not uh, because really, Jim, we're still in the building pieces on boron. Um, you know, when we started this journey. We were anywhere from 0.6 to 0.7 parts per million, some cases lower, uh, for a starting point. And, and for the most part now, we're, we're in that 1 to 1.2 parts per million, and, and in some cases up to 1.5. So I've, I've not reached that plateau um, with that particular element. And then and, and we are adding, um, we're using a 14.3% uh, granular bore generally on an annual basis, and we'll Depending on budget, we'll anywhere put from 10 to 18 pounds per acre out broadcast uh, on an annual basis. Uh, so we're kind of still working on that particular nutrient. One, I was gone for a few minutes briefly, but one question I had for, for Bob on manganese. Um, we, we find that our levels of manganese um, on the test are, are relatively on the low side. I think we'll see uh, tests... Uh, probably on the very low side at 38 parts per million, and it's really rare to see anything above 60 parts per million. And uh, is there is there a uh, interaction there with the glyphosate uh, use that we have been using that would tie up um, that particular cation and make it uh, uh, difficult to extract with, uh, with the extraction procedures you're using? I don't think so. We have, um, surprisingly, uh, people use glyphosate in uh, Missouri <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, the home of Monsanto. Uh, no, but uh, seriously, you know, just naturally in our soils, we'll be running um, 